Right, now we're cooking with gas. Oh, and we're not allowed to do that anymore, are we? No, sorry. Uh, we'll cook with solar. <laughs> okay, in the beginning there was nothing. But then we had soil and plants, and uh, there's, which comes first, I don't know, really. I think it's the dirt, but it's usually come from rock and erosion, and then it gets to dirt, and then there's usually some plants floating around. So uh, it's, uh, that's what starts things off. We have soil, and the soil uh, has all sorts of interesting things happening in there. So they can be broken up into several areas. That, so we can have the physical type, there's, it's great to grow in and the air gets into it, lets water in, it stores water. It has biological uh, um, activity in there and, and mulch on the surface and it comes from rocks and minerals and there's nutrients floating around in there. So we can, um, if you're a soil scientist, you like to put things in, in little um, paddocks. So we've got physical properties, chemical properties and biological properties the things that, uh, if you're a soil scientist going out doing a soil survey, you, you've got to have some uh, uh, regime to actually put, class the soil. So this is the way they do it. And uh, our first physical uh, property that we look at can be uh, our colour. And colour's a, a pretty obvious thing that happens with soils. So it isn't a hugely uh, indicative of the soil... Um, uh, properties, but it is obvious. So uh, our colours range through from red, yellow, brown, black, grey and through to white, as you would probably know from looking at your soils around your farms. And it changes from the surface down to the depths. So we always look at a profile when we look at soils because there's differences from the topsoil through to the, uh, the, the subsoils and onto our base rocks, as you would know from cuttings and digging holes and what have you. So that's one of the first things that that's looked at when you're um, surveying a soil and, and, and trying to work out what, it's, what it is. And then uh, we work on then to the textures. And the textures are involved with sand, silt and clay content of a soil particle. And uh, these can change from the top down through the profile. And uh, as, as you look at this in microscopically, you'll find that the, uh, the particles are... Uh, counterintuitive a bit because your sand's your biggest chunk in there in a particle and your silt is the next biggest and your clay is your finest part particle that, that happens in soil. It's one of the fine ones. So that's a bit of, goes against because you look at a chunk of clay and it's usually in a big clod but in uh, microscopically it's the, it's the finest particles and that makes it very impressive and uh, for as far as our, our needs go with water and nutrients. So that's the texture. We've got to look at the texture and that uh, is uh, uh, another way of looking at it is, it is how it's built into particles. Um, it goes into aggregates or peds. You know, some soils are just fine and loamy and uh, uh, powdery. Others have little clods and those different peds and sizes are all to do with the structure. And it has a lot to do with how the air and the water gets into the soil, how those, uh, how those structures are, are, uh, are happening and how they, how they work. Um, so, um, and that can change down the profile. So we have a look at a couple of different profiles here and you'll see if you go down to the beach and you, and you dig down into a sand dune, you'll find a single grain sand, so it's just sand top to bottom and you'll have uh, no change as much in there. The, uh, another one to the right there is, is a clay soil and uh, it's, called, it's called lenticular. There's all sorts of different names for these different shapes in a clay soil. So you can get flat ones, you can get... Uh, square ones, you can get linear ones, all sorts of different shapes and they all have these technical names uh, in, in a clay soil, a black clay soil particularly. Down further we've got the, uh, the duplex soils, or there's a mass, uh, what they call massive, which means there's hardly any structure, it's very fine. And uh, the one is a silty loam, so that'll be the sort of stuff that you'll turn into a bulldust. It'll go real powdery, talcumy. And then below that you'll see it's got uh, a clay subsoil, which is angular blocky they call it, which is self-descriptive. It's just big chunks of, of square clay uh, underneath the topsoil. One on the next one over is, uh, has a massive uh, soil again, which means there's not a lot of structure in there as far as peds go, but it's a sandy loam. So if you got that between your fingers, you'd feel the sand, the grit in there. So that's what, uh, that, what's what changes the difference between a silty loam and a sandy loam. Sandy loam's got grit in it. And uh, so that'll be your topsoil there. And then you've got... 
and your clay subsoils here is, is formed up in columns, which is uh, quite distinctive in a lot of soils, particularly erosive soils. Sodic soils often have big columns forming, and it's the cracks between those columns where the water gets down and creates tunnels and, and a lot of erosion. So uh, uh, if you've got a soil with, a, with columns uh, under the top soils, it can be a very erosive and hard to manage. The uh, soil all has profiles uh, as we go across the soil uh, descriptions. They all have profiles. Some are, are pretty much the same all the way down, but most of them have several different layers. Um, and we have your topsoil, and then there's a, a, a bit below that that's uh, still more or less topsoil, but not quite as, as nutrient uh, full. And then you have your subsoils, and, and there can be two or three classes of subsoils, and you get onto a base rock. But the main sort of profiles that the soil scientists uh, um, put these into are called uniform, gradational and duplex. So um, I don't know whether you've heard of any of those before, but it's to do with the texture of the soils as we spoke about before. So the uniform texture is like our sand hill. It ch doesn't change. It's the same from top to bottom as far as you dig. Uh, so that's just a uniform profile. The gradational profile is mainly associated with uh, clay soils or that start quite uh, a, a, um, a light clay or a low clay content at the top and they just gradually get heavier and heavier and heavier. So you'll get some red soils like that, some uh, of your brown clays in brigalow soils and, some of, and your black soils that you get on uh, um, open downs and also the, the downs country in, uh, across uh, southern Queensland. So... Uh, there it just gets gradually heavier and heavier as it goes down. As, it gets, as the clay gets heavier, your structure will get more blocky and, and bigger clods as well. The third one is the texture contrast or duplex, where you have a distinct difference in colour and texture from your topsoil to your subsoil. And they're very obvious. You'll see them in cuttings and all over the place. Where there's erosion, you always see that because nearly all, a lot of the soils that erode are, are duplex or texture contrast soils. So your topsoil is normally a loam or a sandy loam uh, and goes down to probably 30, maybe 50 centimetres at the most, not very often, usually about 30 centimetres. And then you come into your subsoils and the subsoils can be uh, quite a good clay or they can be quite um, sodic or, or um, clays that are, are pretty um, unhealthy for plant growth. So oftentimes your topsoil in a duplex is probably the biggest chunk of your rooting depth you might not have roots penetrating much below that if you've got a, a very nasty clay underneath. So um, that's the three sort of profiles that, that, that soil scientists talk about and that we talk about when we're out in the paddock and looking at soils. Um, the upshot of all these things is, is, uh, is, is what we can do with that, what, what is useful to us from a, a production point of view. And soil water response is really the, the guts of it for most of our production. And uh, this little uh, story here, uh, it just points that out very clearly of uh, how the different soils have different water holding capacities, as they are called. So it's the ability of the water to, to uh, hold water for an optimum plant growth, and they call it PAWC, Plant Available Water Capacity. And uh, it's affected by, of course, the uh, soil um, water content, the surface of the soils, and the, uh, the structure and the texture. And then also the subsoils, the same, the structure texture and, and the organic matter and so forth, and the cover on the top of the soils affect this, uh, all that uh, penetration. And then as always, water goes through to deep drainage as well. But uh, if we uh, take this one step further and look at uh, the different soil types and how, they, um, how the water is managed in there or how it uh, stays in there, it, it becomes very interesting. This little uh, graph talks about the ability of different soils to store plant available water uh, down to a metre depth. So it's a millimetres of water to one metre of depth. Uh, so you've got a pretty good soil for that for a start. But uh, our, good, our well structured clay soils, which is your cracking clay soils, and that can be brown, black or red, and uh, can uh, have a field capacity or, or the capacity to hold up to 500 millimetres of water in a metre of depth. So if you're, if you're a cropper out on the downs in, in uh, Emerald, you'll know if you've got a metre of, of good black soil, you've got good water storage for growing crops. So you can get that capacity of, of 500 millimetres of, of water in there, 
The interesting part of this soil is if you go to the next uh, uh, column, you'll see that um, there is um, this wilting, permanent wilting point, and that's where the, the plants who are growing in this crop run out of water. I'm going to pull this off this thing. It's annoying me. Right, so that's when the thing runs out of water. And uh, you'll see that when the uh, wilting point happens in the cracking clays or the good clay soils, you've still got 300 millimetres of water left in the soil that the plants cannot access. So its, t it's plant available uh, content is 200 millimetres, which is good, very good in fact. But it's, it's interesting that there's still a lot of water in there that the plants can't actually access. So you go then to just as uh, an unstructured clay or, an, or a clay that uh, has, isn't cracking and you'll get the uh, 380 of the field capacity, uh, wilting point at about 240. So you've got about 140 of plant available water. So that's, that's quite good still. The, the real uh, ringer in this whole story is loam. We sort of, no wonder loam works well. It has got less capacity to hold water as many of the other two. And, but the wilting point is quite low, down at one, uh, 120. So you've got 220 mils of a plant available water there. This is why a lot of your loamy soils like red soils and creek loams will hang on and hang on and, and give you more production than a lot of the, uh, the heavy clays. So uh, that's a real interesting point uh, on that one. So loams come up in, in the estimation. Mind you, there's not a huge amount of loams around. Uh, sandy loam is, is uh, not quite so good, but again, it's, it's as equal to your clay. So um, your lo sandy loam and your clay, uh, uh, ordinary clay are pretty much the same. So uh, again, a bit, of, a bit of an eye opener. And then of course sand is way down the bottom, doesn't, doesn't hold much water and, and uh, it doesn't retain much. So um, that's an interesting graph to me. It's one of the most important ones that, uh, that you, you get a good feel for what your uh, capability of your soils are and why things happen out there. Uh, next one is uh, chemical properties. So all soils have nutrients, um, all sorts of nutrients. We have the main ones, you'll get a soil test, you'll get your macro nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, calcium, magnesium, they always, always come up. And there's always the micronutrients that the uh, zinc, boron, copper, molybdenum, chlorine, iron, mang manganese, you don't need a lot of those fellas, but they're all in there. And they become particularly important for biological life in, down in there, so fine tuning. A lot of those uh, ones uh, are, are important. And uh, uh, allied to the chemical um, properties and nutrients in your soil is your pH. Your pH of your soil uh, can limit or um, reduce the amount of nutrients that are available to plants in the soil. So that's uh, another thing we have to look at. And again, the actual texture of the soil and clay content can have a, a big... Um, uh, a, um, a big effect on how much nutrients you, your soils hold. So again, we have the story of, uh, and the, this is to do with the surface area. That's why I made the point about clay being very fine particles. It has much more surface area in total to have nutrients and, and things bonding to it. So that's why it can hold a lot more soil. The bigger particles like sand and silt have, no, have less surface area in total. So the, the uh, Chemicals, uh, nutrients cannot bond to them as well. So if you look through the table, you'll see uh, sand is very limited, silt's limited, and uh, then your dark fertile clays are very high, so it has a huge surface area compared to the others. And then your light clay is, is uh, not quite as good. Uh, it's quite infertile too, but the difference there is huge. And it's all about the surface area of the, of the, of the particles of clay uh, that the uh, nutrients can can attach to. So that was uh, another a bit of an interesting point that you probably wouldn't see it or know a lot about, but that's um, very uh, important when we're looking at our, our soils and what we can do with them. Biology, we, we've heard a lot about biology and these guys will be talking heaps about that, I'm sure. And, um, and you've had a lot of talks about biology in the past. So there's all these things happening down there, millions of them squillions of them, and uh, they're all very important to uh, the overall um, nutrient cycling, what's happening down there. If we have a closed natural ecosystem, like uh, this one over here, 
everything goes in, out, and cycles. It just goes round and round. In our production systems, we've got red arrows taking stuff out all the time. So we have to be very conscious of the fact that that red arrow there has taken our cows, our cane, our fodder, whatever, off the farm. So we don't get that coming back in here. It goes and sits in a dump somewhere, down in Brisbane or wherever. So that's, we've got to be very conscious of that when we're looking at our soils and how to retain that, uh, the nutrients and the fertility in the soil. So that's uh, important. If we look at the, uh, the biology that's happening down there, we have all sorts of different brutes in there that do all sorts of exciting things. They're shredders, they're shredders and, and, uh, and barriers and there's predators and parasites and they all have a wonderful time down there. Very water dependent, I might add. And um, all in all, they do their thing and they break down um, organic matter to humus and create the fertility in our, our topsoils. And the main processes that the fertility happens is through uh, the leak of nutrients, as they call it here, which is death or excretion. So they either poop it or they die and they become nutrients. So um, it's just a great big factory down in there of living and pooping and dying. And that's why soils are good when they've got healthy um, biology happening. Rightio. So there we have a story about all our soils. We have chemical, physical and bio biological. But then if we look back at the different uh, soil profiles we looked at there, there is a thing called soil capability that uh, it also comes into soil science and soil, um, uh, I suppose, mapping. And there are some soils that are different in their ca capability to actually produce. So it, the inherent physical capacity of a soil to sustain a range of land uses and management practices in the long term without degradation is, is what soil capability is all about. And if you look at the profiles I've got up there, you'll see that's our good black clay, that's our sand hill, and that's our uh, duplex soil that's probably pretty ordinary. It's rough, it's got columns, so it's a sodic subsoil. And um, those three different soils will have different inherent capabilities, as you would guess. Like the sand hills at the beach don't grow the same amount of food as a black soil flat or a spotted gum ridge. So this is uh, quite uh, blatantly um, shown out in our, uh, in our natural landscape. So if we look at our, our land capability, is demonstrated by our land types. I don't know, a lot of the land types around here, it's fairly uh, in, uh, wet and they're different to the inland land types that I usually work with. So uh, these land types might not gel completely with you. But a spotted gum ridge, you probably have some rough country and ridgy country around that uh, even in A condition, you'll probably only get, say, 12 to 1,800 kgs of dry matter per year in the best condition it can possibly be for production. Whereas if you go across to your good scrub soils, you might be up to six to 8,000 kilograms per hectare of dry matter per year. And they're both those soils are in A condition, or those land types are in A condition. So they're in perfect condition, but they inherently have different productivity levels. So that's something to, uh, that we all know instinctively and, and deal with. But I guess it's probably good to think about that purposefully when you're managing your properties. So there'll be always places, uh, parts of your properties that won't produce as well. Hello, yeah, good. So you've got to invest the time and effort and cap capital in managing your better soils to achieve their optimum sustainable productivity. So that's, th that's the, the key to it. Don't waste time on the poorer soils. Poorer soil types can be managed separately. It's good to delineate them off so you can manage them separately and maximise their sustainable productivity potential without unprofitable capital outlay. You will see time and time again people who go onto a spotted gum ridge and bring the dozers in, lock it all down, and they'll spend four or five hundred dollars an acre and they'll get, still get 1,800 kilograms per hectare of dry matter, unless they put a heap of fertiliser in there, so there's another 500 dollars a hectare or something. So spending a lot of money on poor soils is not great business. So horses for courses, you can't profitably make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. Uh, there are 
circumstances where you might nearly be able to, using some of the biological things that happen, but really not in, in extensive areas. So whole farm management and productivity will benefit from investing time in gaining a good knowledge of your soils, good knowledge of your land types, and making your major development decisions around those better soils, those soils that are going to give you productivity and be able to be managed in the long term with the least inputs and the, uh, the greatest outputs. So, a key part of all this is ground cover. Ground cover is essential to our water and nutrient retention. So regardless of your water soil, you cannot produce or be a sustainable ecosystem without your plants. And that's uh, the plants, th the process of photosynthesis provide the environment and the mechanisms for soils to produce. There was a workshop here not so long ago where uh, Dr. Christine Jones talked all about these things. And I think she's pretty right about a lot of that stuff. So um, she had some science behind it. So that's key to it. Plants, photosynthesis and soil productivity. Key inputs to the productivity other than the biological engine room are your water and your nutrients that are inherent in the soil and that come from the top. So while plants provide the cover for the soil surface, water and nutrients are retained at an optimum level. So as long as you've got your plants up top providing that good cover, you'll, you'll retain water and nutrients at an optimum level. There's a bit of research around behind that, has been for years, and this one is from uh, Mount Mort, which is somewhere in the southeast, but it's pretty graphic. You've got 6% cover on ground, and you've lost 24, 20 to 25% of your um, phosphorus and nitrogen through water loss off the ground and soil loss off the ground. If you've got only 80%, 87% or 90% cover, you've got virtually no loss. So it's not a huge, diff and it's not a huge issue to have 87% cover, but look at the ch changes, look at the benefits in your uh, nutrient retention. Same for water. Ground cover and water runoff has been uh, researched for years and years all over the world, and the story is the same wherever you go. If you've got 20% uh, cover, you'll have 40% runoff. If you've got 90% cover, you'll have 10% runoff. And there's your engine room of all your production, either running off or staying in your soils. There's a lot of talk about retaining banks and, and rehydrating the landscape by putting physical things out there. You don't need physical things. You need good ground cover. Good grass cover will do the same job. No money, no expenses. Right, I've done a little sum on this just to uh, uh, make the point more um, accessible, I guess. There was some work done by some guys another day, not me, Ken Day, uh, and they looked at different grasses and how much they uh, produced off a millimetre of rain. And they came up with a story of two to 10 kilograms per hectare for things like buffalo and, gra and roads grass. So I've averaged that out to about four kilograms per hectare per millimetre. So if we have a, a one in five year storm, uh, one hour long, 50 millimetres in somewhere like Emerald, you've got a rolling landscape, two to 10% slopes, you get some runoff in your pasture. If you've got bare soil, you'll get 50 to 60% runoff. So you're losing 30 millimetres of that 50 millimetres of rain on a bare soil hill. You won't get too many of them, but there are bare soil plats and your farmland can, can be like that sometimes. If you have 90% cover, you're gonna only lose five to 10%. So you're losing about five millimetres of rain. So your difference there is 25 millimetres. And if you've got your four kilograms per hectare of production, 25 by four is 100 kilograms per hectare of extra food that you're growing if you retain that water with your good cover. Your beast will eat 10 kilograms per head per day. So you've got 10 days of feed per hectare extra from that exercise of keeping that soil cover on there. So that doesn't sound much, but if you extrapolate that to a 50 hectare paddock, that's 500 days of feed for one beast. But if you go over a 600 millimetre rainfall area and you've um, got uh, 
a loss of around 1,200 kilograms per hectare per year of productive feed that you could have been putting into animals. So that's a pretty serious loss and it's easy to keep it. It's easy to keep that. All you've got to do is keep your, land, uh, your ground cover on, manage your pasture. The other thing that can be uh, improved is your, uh, carbon in your soil. There's been a lot of talk about soil carbon and so forth. And there's been some research done that 1% of extra carbon in the soil in the top 30 centimetres will give you 1,440, uh, no, 40, whatever that is, litres of water per hectare. <laughs> 144,000 litres of water per hectare. Having trouble with my dyslexia lately. Sorry about that. So that's a lot of water extra from just 1% carbon. I mean, getting put 1% carbon into the soil is not that easy unless you do uh, got some pretty good environments. But anyway, that's, uh, that's a big... So if you get your ground cover right, you actually automatically improve carbon. And if your carbon's increased, you get more water. So more water, more water, more production. So the story I'm, on, I'm trying to tell you it's pretty basic, it's uh, simple, and if you go back to basics and look at it, but if you're knowing your soils, there's a vital step in managing your sustainable productivity because you can be uh, from that to that if you just know what you're doing. So that's it. I think I've almost hit it on time. Any questions? Thanks so much. Oh, Mike? I think you have to be in front of the um, receiver almost. Okay, now, yeah. uh, there we go. Thanks so much, John. Does anybody have a question? Ruby and I are primed and ready to race to you if you've got something to ask. Too early in the day. Oh. Yeah. Hello. Yep. Yeah, my name's Louie. Um, I'm, a, I'm a cane farmer, my, um, my. Mo um, just on that, uh, the blue, blue gum ridges. Mm -hmm. um, now, <coughs> can you take that uh, brigalow scrub country, uh, grow brigalow trees there, and over time, can you build that that soil up to um, to be farmable later on down the track? So um, you're saying to take a spotted gum ridge and put brigalow trees on there, uh, and plant them there, and, th and then get them to uh, improve the soils, is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. Now, well, um, you could try that, but normally your brigalow trees just won't grow there. The soil is not good enough to actually, and it's spotted gum, not blue gum, so uh, that's a key point, because spotted gum ridges are way worse than blue gum. But uh, yeah, no, your brigalow trees will probably not grow there. It's like trying to plant leucina there, or, or um, 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 any of your legume type um, plants that, require deep rooted um, and, and high nutrients to actually get going and, and live, high phosphorus, that sort of stuff. Uh, they just won't sustain there at all unless you have nutrients poured in with them. So that's the problem. That's, that's the inherent capability of the soil will block those plants from growing. That's why brigalow don't grow there in the first place. So you'd spend a lot of money actually getting your establishment of, the, of your um, soil improving trees on those areas. All right, thank you. Anyone else? You're so shy and well behaved, my goodness. Yesterday I couldn't keep you quiet. And today anybody would think I'm going to fine you on the way out if you ask a question. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. No, they're just disinterested. <laughs> Hell no. It's not um, sexy. I'm so interested soils. <laughs> in soils. Like when you understand the profiles of your soils and you understand the plants within those profiles, sometimes we can understand what some of those plants are doing there in the first place. And I, I think actually that's a question I have for you because there's not a lot of knowledge. There is a couple of books about weeds um, in soil profiles, but what do the roots of the plants that exist in those profiles tell us about uh, what's happening as, as far as nutrients and, and uh, bi biology? Uh, well, I couldn't really tell you, to be exact. I'm not, uh, I don't, I'm not um, knowledgeable in that area, but I do know that it's um, the diversity of plant life in any of those soil types is, is key to actually uh, providing the nutrients, providing the biological activity and so forth. So uh, 
the, the biggest, uh, the broader the uh, variety of, of species in there, the better it is and the, the better dif difference between deep-rooted and shallow-rooted the better it is because you get your nutrient uh, sucking from the bottom to the top and, and re-established re on the topsoil and in your, in your uh, mulch and so forth. So, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it, apart from that, that's, yeah, that's my knowledge. You've been schooling up people also in government. You know, how is that experience going to assist landholders into the future, knowing that they have that information now to work with landholders and maybe change regulations and legislation around trees, particularly in grazing and farming landscapes? Oh, well, that's a that's a big can of worms, and uh, <laughs> it's <laughs> it's nothing that I could have influence over, unfortunately, and not too many other people either. So that's going to be a uh, a, a battle, I suppose, or a an ongoing um, discussion between producer groups and the government agencies, and where that leads to in the long run will be who knows. But uh, yeah, it's certainly an evolving feast, and um, as you well know, the reef regs have been rolled out to different areas and so forth, and there's different tree veg uh, laws happening now. So, um, and that will dare say continue and evolve, and just how who knows it'll be a. Uh, who's got the biggest sort of good argument about whatever in the future, I guess? Well, it's heartening to know that people like you are doing work in that space. Does anyone have any questions non-government related? <laughs> Thanks, John. Just a, all, this, all that's great. So where do you start? If, if you come, you know, you, you start into a, a property or a paddock... Um, and you've got those ambitions to improve your soil, where do you start? What does that look like? Is it soil tests, compaction tests? What are the, the key metrics to look for um, to start to build that ground cover and, and build a plan of where you want to go and what good looks like? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I guess the, the, the first thing that's easiest for, and it doesn't cost you much money, is to actually just go in there and look at your land types. So you will, you will see natural differences in, in the landscape. So down along your creek beds, you'll have your, your riparian veg right on your, in your creeks. Then you'll have the, some flats where there's a bit of, uh, there'll be deposits of loams and, and uh, erosion, um, sorry, alluvial soils there. So that's normally fairly high in phosphorus. It's a bit better soil as normal. And uh, there could be places where there's cracking clay black soils where it's just grass, not much trees. There could be clumps of brigolo or there could be clumps of softwood scrub with you might have uh, uh, some bottle trees or something like that. And so you try and delineate those areas and, uh, and just normally by looking at it, you'll see which ones of those are the most productive in each season. There'll be a heap of grass on your better soils and on your poorer soils, even in a good season, there'll be different types of grass. There won't be your, your good productive grasses, there'll be things like your wire grasses and so forth, so um, they'll, uh, they'll naturally st stick, st uh, stick out to a little bit. And then uh, if you are still having a bit of trouble, you'd probably be a good idea to get a local agronomist or someone like that to, to come and have a look. And then you can start doing soil tests if you want to go into, say, uh, trying to improve things. But uh, uh, just if you've got uh, mainly a grass pasture in your, in your area and you're looking for uh, productivity and, and uh, and running cattle and the like, just introducing a legume or a variety of legumes into the pasture will make a big difference just straight up. And that's not huge cost. You can sod seed and that sort of stuff. So, um, yeah, and, and don't be afraid to go to your regional groups and ask for help. There's a lot of people in the regional groups who have good knowledge about pasture and soils and they're very happy to come and give you a hand and, and, and help you do a farm plan, for instance, to delineate your land types and, and work out management uh, practices to go forward. We have time for one more question. I think it's coming from this gentleman over here. Uh, probably just following on from that question a little bit. One of your slides had uh, two photos. One's showing a circular system in your soils mm -hmm. where everything's sort of circulating around. The other one showed where you have leakage in your soils in this area, mostly cane and uh, cattle. Mm. So the question is, how, how do you, with that leakage of nutrients from your soils, how do you maintain your soils with the proper nutrients? and me measuring that nutrient loss through the leakage? Well, given our, our current technologies, you, the, the only way you really can do it is to do soil tests regularly 
and check your nutrient levels and you can go to the micronutrients as well and you try to put that, that back in there, you try to get it back in somehow and you can do that by um, some organic methods, by in introducing manures and those sort of things, by in increasing your, uh, your uh, uh, retention of, um, of um, organic matter or you can go the chemical path where you get in the, the nutrients you need from your local uh, agronomist. So there's, there's several ways to do that, but yes, you normally, you really have to just trace that, uh, see what's happening in there, and, and other than soil tests, there's not other, a lot of other ways to do that at the moment. And then, uh, and then try and replace that nutrients however you can, either naturally or with a, a chemical replacement. Coming along tomorrow to Tony Jefferson's at Bloomsbury, you'll find a lot more information from John Day. There'll be a field walk, and then John's going to look at soil regeneration and conservation with the profile examination on site, hands on. And if you want, you can take my place. Thank John Day for that wonderful presentation. We look forward to walking the field with him tomorrow.